Hazard. Today's khutbah, no prizes for guessing what today's khutbah is about. Today's khutbah is about the World Cup. Today's khutbah, inshallah, was speaking about the World Cup. However, the World Cup and Ramadan, not only the World Cup. As you know, the World Cup is well underway, and in the middle of Ramadan, we'll be approaching the World Cup quarterfinals, semifinals, and indeed the finals. And the last time Ramadan and the World Cup they coincided was 1986. And maybe, many, maybe uh, many of you remember when you were learning to fast in 1986 and how long the days they were 35 uh, plus years ago. So the reality is that in this World Cup, World Cup FIFA 2014, many, many Muslim players, they are participating in the World Cup from countries as diverse as Algeria and Ghana and Nigeria and even Bosnia and even in the French squad there are many uh, Muslim players. And what we find is that sporting bodies through the history of time, they have always respected the religion of participants. Like for example, many Christian athletes in the past, they refused to participate on a Sunday. I think Roger Bannister, who was the one who broke the four minute mile, he refused to participate on a Sunday. Similarly, Jonathan Edwards, who was a British uh, long jumper, he also refused, he was a Jew, and he refused to participate on a Saturday. And they rearranged the tournament dates to accommodate uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. So we find that sporting bodies through history, they have always respected certain faiths. However, we find that FIFA, they did not take into account in their planning that Ramadan and the World Cup, they coincided. So this shows the state of the Muslims and how Muslims are perceived. However, we find at the same time that many non-Muslims, they also, they paid respect to the Muslims during their football tournaments. Like for example, PSV Eindhoven, a Dutch team, they developed a special diet rich in liquids such that Muslim football players, they could participate while fasting. And we also find Loughborough University, they did a lot of research in the lead up to the Olympics in 2012, how to help Muslim participants fast and take part in this world level of competition. And uh, some of their research it showed that the difference between a Muslim who fasts and a Muslim who does not fast and participates in an athletics tournament, they said was about 0.1%. However, the, the reality is that that level of competition, even 0.1%, it can make, mean the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal. So they found that the impact was only 0.1%. So imagine you and I, many of us, we spend our working days in Ramadan sitting down quite comfortably in front of a computer, a very sedentary lifestyle. Well, these people, they're, they're running at top speeds. So Loughborough University, they found that the impact on a Muslim's performance is very, very subtle. They also try to extrapolate this research to football. However, they said in football is different. In football, you have some players, in say 11 players in a team, you have some players who are fasting, other players, they're not fasting. So they said the impact uh, of a player, of one or two players fasting in a team, is even less. In fact, it's negligible. And they came up with some very, very interesting points to help Muslim players who are fasting. They said one of the things which can help a Muslim player fast is to gargle water, which is in Arabic known as madmada. Madmada meaning like in wudu, when you make the wudu, you gargle water. And they said that gargling water it has a psychological effect of making the body think that the body is drinking, that you, that you are actually drinking. So they encourage this madmada, this uh, gargling. And this is similar to the use of the miswak. Using the miswak in fasting, this is recommended because it gets the juices, the saliva in your mouth moving. So again, it has that kind of effect that, that your throat is not parched, that you actually uh, you are drinking something. So madmada, making wudu for the five prayers, and using the miswak, these are all techniques which have been proven by research to help the fasting person simulate as though he is not fasting. So all of this is of use. Other techniques they discovered in their research, I think it was Blackburn Rovers, they undertook some research and they found that using cold towels, this also helps people overcome fasting during the long summer day. So does a football player have to fast or does he not have to fast? This is a very, very important question. In the 2012 Olympics, the UAE soccer team, they referred this matter to the Wizard al awqat the Ministry of Religious Matters. And they said that just by participating in a football tournament, this does not make you exempt from fasting. You must still fast. However, they gave them the dispensation based on the fact that they are travelers, that they travel to other parts of the world, and on this basis, they are allowed to break the fast. So we find that most of the nations 
who have traveled to Brazil to play the World Cups, and most of them they are travelers. So on this basis, they are allowed not to fast, and then they make up the fasting thereafter. So this is very, very important. However, some high-level football players, they have sought to assert their identity, and they said, no, that even when I am traveling, I will still fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said in the Quran فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيبًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنَ يَامٍ أُخَرٍ That whoever he fasted, uh, uh, whoever was ill or he was on a journey, then he can make up other days. So some uh, Muslim players, they decided they will fast. So I wanted to today share some parallels between uh, World Cup football and Ramadan. We find in the 2012 Olympics one of the British rowing team, he, he was a Muslim, and he said that for every single day I miss of Ramadan, then I will feed 60 people. Is this allowed? So in effect, he will miss 30 days of fasting, so he will feed 1,800 people, which no doubt is a very noble thing to do. However, is this allowed? Are you allowed to feed someone in this kind of situation? The answer is no, that it is not allowed to do DIY Islam, do Islam yourself. Rather, you must obey the rules. And in Islam, the rules are very, very clear. The rules are that most Muslims, above the age of puberty, they must fast. They have no excuse. Many Muslims, they feel weak in Ramadan. The days are very, very long. I can't fast. Inshallah, you can do it. Children as, as young as six or seven, they are fasting in countries hotter than this one. And millions of Muslims, billions of Muslims, they have fasted in the past. So why can you not fast? Many of our grandfathers, uh, they were farmers. Many of our grandfathers, they were farmers. And they fasted, and they were engaged in hard labor, a bit like playing in the World Cup. So as a general rule, we say that most Muslims above the age of puberty, they must fast, and there is no excuse. This is something which is known in the religion of Islam by necessity. Every Muslim knows that fasting is a pillar of Islam. Every Muslim, every non-Muslim knows that fasting is a pillar of Islam. It's part and parcel of being a Muslim, just like praying is part and parcel of being Muslim. So who is exempt from fasting, and what can they do instead? There are several categories of people who are exempt from fasting. Number one is a traveler, somebody who goes on a long journey, then he does not have to fast, however he must make up those days. Number two, we have the sister on a menstrual cycle. Again, she does not fast, however she must make those days up. Number three, we have the woman who is pregnant. While she is pregnant and she fears for herself and her child, then she does not fast and she must make those days up. Number four, we have the, the woman who is settling. This woman, again, she does not fast and she must make those days up. Then we have the sick person who is suffering a temporary illness. Then he consults a Muslim doctor and if the doctor says it's better for you not to fast, then he should not fast and he must make those up. So we see that in all these scenarios, you are required to make up. So who is able to feed instead of making up? And the person who is allowed to feed instead of making up is number one, the person who is very, very old or very, very physically fragile. This person, he does not fast and he does not need to make up. Rather, he feeds, for every day missed, he feeds one person. Not like this rower who for every day he fed 60 people. Rather, one day, one person. And this is only for the elderly and also those who have illnesses which they normally would not expect to recover from. Say somebody has cancer, uh, Allah protect us from this. Or some other serious illness, then that person, he only has to feed one person. So in Islam, the rules are clear. You can't just make things up as you go along. So consult the doctor if you're not sure, and uh, you must make them up. Also to say that somebody who is very, very uh, elderly, if they are able to fast in winter, then they should make up the days in winter. In winter, the days are very short. We're going to be fasting 20 hours plus. In winter, the fasting day may only be 12 hours. So if somebody uh, who is ill has to time their medication, then they can delay the fasting. However, the general rule, I'm sure most people in this room, they, it is an obligation upon them to fast in Ramadan and they have no excuse. Going back to the theme of today, which is the World Cup, is that Ramadan is a serious matter. It's not just a case of leaving uh, the food and the drink. It's also Ramadan is a very, very spiritual time. Even if we say about the World Cup footballers that they are exempt from fasting because they are traveling. They have missed out on the spirituality of the month. FIFA has deprived them of the spirituality of the month, even if they are fasting. Today I wanted to mention uh, one World Cup footballer who used to be the captain of Manchester United. And um, he's from Ivory Coast. He's a Muslim and his name is Kolo Toure. I believe that's the correct way you pronounce it. And he used to play English Premier League uh, for one whole month. 
So you can imagine how physically, how enduring this is. And he made some very, very good statements about fasting and Ramadan. And he said, it doesn't affect me physically, it makes me stronger. You can do it when you believe in something so strongly. So it's all about mind over matter. When you speak to a non-Muslim, what do they say? They always say, I could never do it. However, I always say, you could do it. If you had the Iman, if you had the belief, you can do it. Because there are children who are six and seven years old who are doing it. So why can you not do it? Do it. So most people who are in average state of health, they can uh, undergo the fasting. And it's all the inner game. When, when you get to a high level of sport, they talk about mastering the inner game. It's all about mastering the psychological aspect that you can do it. And you're doing it for the sake of Allah. So that's another reason why you can do it. So uh, make sure you don't miss Ramadan for any kind of silly excuse that you don't feel like it or you're going to make up your own rules. Some of the ulama, they said the person who misses one day of Ramadan without an excuse, even if he fasted for the entire, for the rest of his life, he would never ever be able to compensate for that Ramadan 2014, that one day missed. Others, they said that the one who misses a day of Ramadan without excuse, He's worse than the, the adulterer. He's worse than the one who drinks alcohol. He said, this is your pillar. This is a big part of your Islam. So do not uh, miss Ramadan for this kind of excuse. I also forgot to mention that uh, some other interesting things about, about the World Cup is that in Brazil at the moment, the fasting day is 11 hours compared to our 20 hours. However, we have to remember the humidity. The humidity, which would make maybe the fasting in Brazil maybe more challenging than the fasting uh, uh, here. Also, uh, the University of Loughborough, they discovered that a normal person in a day should, should take in about four liters of water. However, for a football player to get fully hydrated, to refuel mid-air before the game, because most of the kickoffs they are after uh, sunset, for him to refuel, he must drink six liters. So it's very, very important, brothers and sisters, that when you're fasting in Ramadan, that when it comes to iftar time, make sure you drink a lot. You drink more than you normally drink. And similarly, through the time of Taraweeh, inshallah, certainly in the center here, you will have plenty of water available. It's very, very important to master the physical aspect of fasting, is to make sure you drink a lot. And they found as well that people, uh, sports uh, people, who they drink a lot to hydrate, for a composition that they had to add sodium to the water to help them retain the water so they don't go to the toilet uh, so often. So we see that life is a competition of good deeds. Some of these players, they have waited their entire life to play in the World Cup. All year round, they're playing at national level or at local level. However, the World Cup is the pinnacle. Similarly, we as Muslims, we are competing at local level, a national level for 11 months in the year. 11 months in the year, maybe we're fasting, we're reading Quran, we're performing at a lower level. However, in Ramadan, we have to up our game. In Ramadan, we have to imagine that this is the World Cup. This is the time we have been waiting for. It's an honor to participate in the World Cup. Whether you win the World Cup or not, it's irrelevant. The main thing is that you participated in the World Cup. You had a cap for England. You played for England. So we are playing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it should be an honor that you are participating in Ramadan, which is the competition of all competitions. How many people they have gone to the grave in the last 12 months? They would be honored to participate in Ramadan 2014. So remember, brothers and sisters, that life is a competition. In the World Cup, only one team can win. Even if they make it to the finals, then the, te the team was lost. They lost. They were the losers, just like England, and, and just like so many other teams, they lost. However, in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can all be winners. We can all be winners. The reality is that people, they will cross the finishing line at different times. Some people, they will die early, and other people, they will die late. However, in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can all be winners. And we must have that competitive drive. The World Cup players, they're very, very competitive people. Look, they're biting one another to win the games. They're shining lasers in each other's eyes to make sure they win. In Islam, you don't need to bite anybody and you don't need to use any kind of laser. However, you must have a competitive drive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you look at the Quran, you find that Allah Ta'ala tries to energize us and activate us to make us competitive, particularly in the Ramadan World Cup. Now Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ فِي جَنَّةِ النَّعِينَ That the competitors, أُولَئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ These are the ones who are close to Allah in the, the paradise, in the Jannat al-Na'im. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He also says that not only should we be competitors, we should hope to be examples so that we are paid status for other people. Not only do we win, but people, they look at us ahead and they think, I wish I could be like such and such a brother. Look how many good deeds he's doing. He's always in the masjid 
He's always reading the Quran, he's always fasting, he's always doing so many good things. When you have a pace setter, then you always do better. When you are a pace setter, you are the best. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us a dua that we should make a dua that Allah makes us pace setters. Some people, when they look at us, they feel like doing more. And then subconsciously, that we are getting reward because people, they're taking us as their role models. Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الْإِمَامَ But those who say, Ya Allah, make our children and our wives the coolness of our eyes and make them for the pious people an imam. By imam, what do we mean by making us an imam? By imam, we don't mean the imam in the mosque. By imam, we mean the imam in the true sense of the word imam, being a leader. Being a leader that you are an example, you are a qudwa. For qudwatun hasana, you are a good example for other people. When they look at you, they think, mashallah, this brother, he always beats me in good actions. There are many, many ayahs in the Quran about racing, about being a leader. Like for example, when Roger Bannister, he broke the four minute mile. One of the techniques he used to break the four minute mile was that he had pace setters. He had people who would start running at different points within the mile. Why? Just that there was always someone who was slightly ahead of him. And in fact, they used this technique in long distance running. They usually have four or five people who run together. And then at the end, they sprint to the finishing line. So Roger Bannister, he achieved this by always seeing somebody slightly ahead. When you see somebody doing more, you feel like doing more. When you're number one, you feel complacent. So try to see what other people are doing in Ramadan. And you see brothers, mashallah, and sisters doing many, many good actions. Wish to be like them. You don't wish to take it away from them. Rather, you wish to be like them. And this is found in many ayat from the Quran. Uh, she mentions from the ayat in the Quran about competing. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْعَرْضُ عِدَّةِ الْمُتَّقِينَ That race in the, to the forgiveness of your Lord in a paradise whose width is the width of the heavens and the earth prepared for the believers. So this is the race for Jannah. This is not the race for the World Cup trophy which is made of 18 karat gold. Rather this is the race for the everlasting paradise. And Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And let the people who compete, compete for this. And Allah Ta'ala has said about all good actions in Islam, about racing, He has said, with regards to the private prayer, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَايِعِ He has said that all you who believe when it comes to the Friday prayer, then race to the Friday prayer, race to the Friday prayer, try to get here early and get more ajr, get more reward, whether uh, and leave aside trading and business. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that there should be no envy apart from two people. Number one, a person who recites the Quran beautifully, it's just that the Imam, he recites by day and by night, and then the neighbor, he hears the recitation, and he says, I wish I had been given a voice like this person, just that I could be like him. And then the other person who Allah has blessed with money. And then he gives the money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the neighbors, they look upon him and say, I wish I had been given money. Why? To live in a big house? No, not for this reason. Such that you could do the same as that person did. And give away the money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in reference to ghibta, which is a type of jealousy which is different from hasad. Hasad is a jealousy when you see somebody with something and you want it for yourself and you want that person to be deprived of that thing at the same time. Well, ghibta is a positive form of jealousy where you want it for yourself but you do not wish your brother to be deprived of it. So brothers and sisters, let's not forget that we are in World Cup FIFA 2014 and more importantly, we are in Ramadan 2014. <laughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم ما بعد. In Islam, we are encouraged to compete for good deeds. There are certain things which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned with regards to competing for good deeds. He said that if people knew the reward for making the adhan, then they would have drawn lots. We find in many many masajid that nobody wants to make adhan, but everybody wants to lead the prayer. So the adhan, this has a very very big reward. Similarly, praying in the first row, we find a bad habit amongst many Muslims that they delay in praying in the first row. When I went uh, to Mr. Nabawi in, in Medina, and you find the sheikh, they sit on these big wooden chairs in the back of the mosque giving lessons. However, you find that when the iqama is called, they're like Linford Christie. They're running through the rows to the first line. They know that the most reward, you're in the mosque, 
You're going to pray, so make the most of your prayer. Make sure you're in the first row. So learn to compete. And similarly, he said that if people only knew the reward of coming to the morning prayer, Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Isha, the night prayer, then they would have crawled to attend these prayers if they had known the reward. So this is an encouragement of competition. The most famous example of competition in the whole of Islam is the competition between Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. It's the most famous form of competition. And the competition it began during the Battle of Tabuk, where all the Muslims, or many, many Muslims, they went to fight the Roman Empire. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the Muslims to stand in the way of Allah. So the Muslims came with much wealth and they placed it in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Umar, he came and he said, today I will beat Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He came with half his wealth. And he was very, very proud that uh, today Abu Bakr, he will not outstrip me. And then Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he came with his entire wealth and said, I have left Allah and his messenger for my family. And the story is very, very famous. And there is a similar story where once our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the presence of Abu Bakr and Umar, he praised the reciter of Qur'an, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and said that, MashaAllah, if anybody wants to recite the Qur'an in the same way it was revealed, then let him recite the Qur'an uh, in the way Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recites the Qur'an. Umar, he rushed to the house of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to inform him of this good news. And making the Muslim happy is one of the best actions you can do in Ramadan, outside of Ramadan. So he knocked on the door of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that night and said, I have glad tidings for you. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he answered the door and he said, why have you come at night? He said, I have come to give you the good tidings that the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that anyone who wants to recite the Qur'an the way it was revealed, then let him recite the Qur'an like you. He said, I already know. He said, how do you know? He said, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, he came first class. He was here and he beat you to it. So then he resigned himself to the fact he would never beat Abu Bakr and he said that whenever we compete, Abu Bakr always wins. So then, you know, the pecking order, it was well established. Competing in the dunya, we find that the Muslims, they're forever competing in the dunya. People are buying for bigger houses, bigger cars, more sons, this and that. This kind of competition, this is something which is fitri. This is something which is innate in the human being. It's something you cannot escape from. However, we should try to bridle this level of competition within ourselves. And try to be more competitive in the akhirah and less competitive in the dunya. Today I want you to speak about the World Cup final. However, not the World Cup final in FIFA 2014, the final on the Day of Judgment. First past the finishing line. Who will be the first person to enter Jannah? This is the competition. Who's going to be number one? No prizes for guessing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will be the first past the post. And in a hadith in the collection of Imam Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that on the Day of Judgment, he will be the first one who will be raised. The horn will be blown and the people they will rise from their graves and he will be the first one. And he will go to paradise and the keeper of paradise, he will say, who are you? And he will say, I am Muhammad. And he will say that I have been told to never open the door of paradise until you arrive. And then the door of paradise will be open and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be the first one to enter. There are also some narration that a woman will run in after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she will be the one who looks after the orphan. She will be the one who will look after the orphan and she will be the second one. However, there are the hadith which say that the second person to enter Jannah will be Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When the first sallallahu alayhi wa said that Jibreel in a dream or maybe during the Isra al Mi'raj, he showed me the doors of paradise. Now Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he said that I wish I had been there and he said that oh, Abu Bakr, you will be the first one from my ummah that will enter through this door. So we see here, brothers and sisters, that this is a real competition. There will be winners. And we said before that everyone who enters paradise is a winner. Every Muslim, inshallah, there will be a winner, no matter what their deeds, inshallah, as long as they truthfully die, and la ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, then there will be a winner. However, even amongst winners, we have different breeds and different classes. What about the last person to enter paradise? We've now established the first person is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Followed by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. What about the last person? The hadith of the last person is well known. The aqidah of the Sunni Muslims is that if anybody uh, died in Laila Hidd Allah Muhammad Rasulullah, then even if they went for a hellfire, into the hellfire for a short period of time, then eventually they will be rescued. So the last person to be rescued, he will be rescued. He will regard himself as the most fortunate person on the face of the earth. He will say that no one is luckier than me. I have been saved from the hellfire. And then he will uh, see a tree in the distance 
And then he will wish, if only I was further away from the hellfire and I was under this blessed tree. And he will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Ya Allah, this is the last thing I would ever ask for you. All I want to do is to be removed from the hellfire and sit under the shade of this tree away from the hellfire. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, that, O son of Adam, do you promise that if I give you this tree, you will never ever ask me anything ever again? So he promises and says, Ya Allah, you have rescued me from the hellfire. If only you move me to this tree, I will never ever ask for anything again. And then he is placed under the tree. And then he sees another tree and he thinks for a long time. That I promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I will never ask again. And then how can I ask for this tree? In the end, he cannot resist the temptation. He says, Ya Allah, this is the last time. I just want to go and sit under this tree and I will never ever ask you anything ever again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh son of Adam, you are so wretched. You said to me that you will never ask me anything again. And now you are asking for the next tree. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his infinite mercy, he then moves this last Muslim to this tree. And again, the same thing happens. And finally, he comes to a tree which is close to the doors of paradise. And then he hears the joy of the people of paradise. And he wishes to enter paradise. And then he says, Ya Allah, this is the very last one. If you answer this, I will never ever ask anything again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, like, what do you want? And he says, I want this. Allah says you will have everything in the dunya and double. And in some hadith you will have everything in some times. So we see that everyone on the day of judgment is a winner. Anyone who went to Jannah is a winner. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاهِزْ فَاهِزْ in Arabic means winner. The one who succeeds, the faiz, he is the winner. So anyone who is moved away from the hellfire and entered into paradise, then he has won. As we know, as I mentioned already, the World Cup trophy is made of 18 karat gold. However, we should take solace from the fact that paradise is made of gold. Paradise, paradise is made of gold. It's something pithy, something which is natural. The people, for some reason, they love gold. And the Prophet ﷺ, he described paradise and said that the houses in paradise, they have bricks of gold and silver. And the mortar between the bricks is made of musk the perfume, and the pebbles, they're made of pearl and sapphire, and the soil is made of saffron. And whoever enters Jannah, he will be filled with joy and will never feel miserable. So many people are suffering in their lives, depression, and so many other things. Imagine Jannah, you will never feel miserable ever, ever again, and you will live forever, and you will never die. And their clothes will never wear out, and their youth will never fade. <coughs> Prophet some said that I entered paradise and uh, the tree is their trunks were made of gold. And he, he said that when he went to paradise, he saw the house of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, and it was made of gold. So in conclusion, what can we say uh, about the World Cup? We can say that how will we spend the nights of Ramadan? Will we spend the nights of Ramadan watching the World Cup and reading the Taraweeh? Is this the way we will spend the nights of Ramadan? Or will we spend 24 hours sleeping, hoping that this will numb the, the pain of fasting? There is nothing wrong with following the World Cup moderately. Rather, Islam, it encourages sports. So there is nothing wrong with this. However, don't waste your entire Ramadan uh, being some kind of World, World Cup follower. Rather, follow the World Cup moderately and spend your nights preparing for the next day of fasting. Spend your night in dua. Now, praying and making dua at night is one of the easiest things because the night is only very, very short. So in the last third of the night, this is the time and whatever problem you have in your life, and this is the time to ask. So, instead of playing the World Cup, why don't we this year go for the pentathlon? I know the Olympics 2012 has finished. However, why don't we do the pentathlon instead of the World Cup? Pentathlon meaning five sports, meaning Quran, fasting, zikr, sadaqah, and dua. Let's be competitive in the pentathlon. In Ramadan, in life, there is no 100 meters. In the Ramadan Olympics, in the Ramadan World Cup, there is no quick fix. There is only long distance. There is only long distance. People enter Jannah all their lives, they worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be a long distance runner in Ramadan, have stamina, have iman, and know that there is no extra time. In life there is no extra time, that when the angel of death comes, there will be no extra time, that the Ramadan will be over. And for many of us, who knows, maybe this is the last Ramadan. Finally, I want to end the khutbah, not with a hadith, or not with an ayah from the Qur'an. This is one of the few khutbahs you will hear. You will not hear a hadith ayah from the Qur'an, rather you will hear the statements of football players, the difference between football players who are Muslim and football players who play football in Ramadan and fast in Ramadan. The Algerian captain, mashallah Algeria, they're true. 
the Algerian captain, he said that last year during Ramadan, we played against Zambia after sunset. He said, we stopped fasting at 7 p.m. and kickoff was at 10 p.m. So he only had three hours to hydrate mm -hmm. for the football game. He said it was a real challenge. But in the end, faith gives you the strength to overcome difficulties. Master the inner game. Don't be afraid of Ramadan. Ramadan is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. However, we should be happy about Ramadan. Real Madrid midfielder, Mahmoud Diara, he said, all of the coaches have respected my decision to fast and play football. He said it's not easy, and of course, you feel the need to take in food, but it only lasts a month. For Ramadan is only 30 days. The whole year, the history year, is 355 days. So only 30 days of Ramadan, then Ramadan will be a distant memory. And my favorite football player, Manchester City player from uh, Ivory Coast, Kolo Tore, he said some really great things about Ramadan. And you know, when these people speak, people listen. If I mention a hadith, nobody will listen. But if the media report these things, then thousands upon thousands, they listen to these people. This is when somebody uh, who is influential becomes a Muslim, really, it's powerful for the da'wah. Just like Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he made dua for Amr ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu to become a Muslim because he was very, very useful for Islam. So Qawla Qawla Ture, he said, the first five days of Ramadan, they are very, very difficult because your body is climatizing. And he said, after that, your body starts to adapt. And more importantly, he said, personally, having faith helps my football, and help, foot, playing football helps me to be healthy and strong, and there is no conflict, because people who know about Islam know that fasting empowers and does not weaken the Muslims. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for all the Muslims all over the world to fast the days of Ramadan. He forgives all the Muslims through the prayer, through the Quran, through the Taraweeh, and uh, freezes the fall of so we may all win the Ramadan World Cup, inshallah, on the day of Tijan. Salam alaikum.